Welcome everybody to what is a lovely day here in Wellington, albeit a winter's day. Um, my name is Mindy Clues and here at Equinox IT, I'm the manager of our learning services. Equinox IT injects fresh thinking to solve tough business problems and we deliver software development, training and consulting services. Today with me I have Rowan Bunning who is our um, Australian based training partner for Scrum training. Now Rowan is a leader in Scrum software development in the Australasian region and he's been working with us here at Equinox IT for six years it turns out this month. Um, Rowan is a certified Scrum trainer with the Scrum Alliance and he's Sydney based, he runs his company Scrum with Style. Today Rowan's going to be talking with us about how to overcome common agile problems using large scale Scrum or what's become known as LESS. If you have questions during the webinar, please enter these in the right hand side console. We might answer these as we go, otherwise we'll save them up to the end as a question and answer session. We are recording this webinar and we'll send you through a link to the recording um, over the next week or so. Feel free to share that recording with your friends or colleagues who are unable to make it today. Now, as we get underway, we'd like to hear a little bit from you about what scaled agile frameworks that you're aware of. I'm going to put a poll up. Now you can respond to this poll by selecting any or any of those options that apply to you. So which scaled agile frameworks are you aware of? I'll give you an opportunity to respond to that poll now. You can see that a number of you are aware of the scaled agile framework or SAFE. And that's evening up now with those of you who are aware of LESS or the large scale scrum framework. And um, a few of you, a third who have heard of disciplined agile delivery. So I'm going to close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. And I will share those results with you shortly, they'll pop up on the screen. So you can see there that um, that there are a few large scale Scrum frameworks out there and we are talking with you today, or Rowan will be talking with you today about um, large scale Scrum or less. Um, Rowan, is that, is, are those results fairly consistent with what you're hearing um, from your clients and colleagues in Australia? Yes, I guess so, yes. Um... I think, yeah, safe or large ag scaled agile framework is quite well well recognised, and large scale Scrum is something that's come up more recently, I guess, and that's uh, what we're going to talk about today. It's um, something I think is going to be much more well recognised in the future. Fantastic. So, Rowan, um, I'm going to hand over the presentation to you now. Uh, we'll be finishing around 12.45. We'll have a few moments prior to that for questions and answers. Like I said, please share your questions with us as you go, and I'll manage those on behalf of Rowan. Rowan, over to you. Great. Thanks, Mindy. Yeah, it's uh, great to be here again in Wellington, and uh, six years, I can't believe it's been that long since we started working with Equinox uh, on the Scrum training. So uh, just some of the thoughts uh, in response to, I guess, the question of why it's challenging uh, implementing Agile at scale, um, I guess our IT organisations have been optimising around waterfall or some variant of, of this sort of thing for years and years. And I guess when we think about how our organisations were designed and set up, um, the organizational structures, the roles and responsibilities, the processes and all of these things. Uh, were we considering the agile values and principles, the lean thinking, these sorts of concepts? Uh, probably not. Um, so a lot of these things we'll be talking about with large scale Scrum and with Scrum and Agile in general, uh, are things that are, are new to the organization or relatively new and look a little different, I guess, from perhaps some of the principles and some of the, the thinking that was used when we 
constructed a lot of the organization uh, in the first place. So, yeah, I guess that's a bit of an answer to, to one of the questions we were <laughs> looking to, to ask you guys. But um, I guess one of some of the challenges are big functional groups, um, analysis group, testing group, um, all these different sort of functional areas, big batches, as in uh, doing a large quantity of a project or a product development in one particular activity step before passing it to another group and sequential processes as you'd be familiar with with uh, waterfall style processes. Uh, it often creates weak feedback loops because we don't hear about the impact of our decisions in our analysis and design and what we do till a lot later after we've actually done that work and of course there's lots of handoffs, big batch handoffs as we go. Okay, uh, so there's lots of things I was looking to uh, touch on today and um, some of these are, are shorter and some of these are a little bit bits more in depth um, along with these lines. So quick thoughts on systems thinking. I want to have a very quick high level introduction to less or large scale scrum and um, just give you a few high level uh, concepts about that and then get into some of these challenges or dysfunctional kind of situations that we often uh, find ourselves in when we uh, try to to work at scale. Um, so water scrum fall is a, is a great term for one of them. Um, what I'm calling dependency hell or you know dependency challenges. Um, release rigidity, difficulty to release at the market cadence or when we want to release and be more flexible uh, about that. And something called the contract game uh, I'd like to briefly outline. Uh, so there's a couple of things about cross-team learning and cross-team design and architectural alignment that we could touch on very briefly as well. So I thought we might just move through that. Um, just a thought on systems thinking. Uh, I guess if you wanted to get from Wellington to Palmerston North, let's say, um, then what sort of system might you use to do that? Um, you might think of perhaps a, a car or something along these lines. However, to get from Wellington to Sydney, as I'll be doing perhaps tomorrow, um, the, the car type system might not be sufficient for, for solving that problem. We might need quite a different sort of system for that. So really the point here is that a given system has finite performance characteristics. We can't expect a car to get us across the, the Tasman. Um, so we might uh, actually need to think about a different sort of system. So if your organization, yeah, if you think of it as a system, uh, you can think of it as being optimized to produce the results it's currently producing, if you want to take a, a small amount. So if you don't, if you actually want quite different results, you may need to actually change the organizational system that produces those results. And I guess that's what a lot of what we're getting to with systems thinking is about and a lot of what uh, large scale Scrum is based on is that sort of thinking. So there might be a certain realm of what you can do within your current capability in terms of not just what you're trying to produce as a product, but also your ability to be agile. Um, and outside of those bounds of your current capability, you might think of that as impossible or outside of uh, current capability at least anyway. But if you have an opportunity or something you want to achieve that requires you to do something that's not within your current capability, you might actually need to expand that capability. And that's a lot of what this capability building emphasis is about and continuous improvement is about really with, with Agile and, and Scrum in general. And often in Scrum we see the Scrum Master as being someone who's taking a lead in uh, actually capability building and management having a role in, in really supporting that and actively helping to improve capability. Um, so. We have another poll question. I thought we might see what your thoughts are on the challenges um, with scaling Agile. So I've got the poll up there for you now. What are the biggest challenges that you see when scaling up Agile? You can select any and all that apply to you. And um, once again, when those, um, when those results are in, I'll be able to share those with you. So go ahead now and make your suggestions or your selections for the biggest challenges that you see when you're scaling up Agile. So it's a, um, it's a fairly even spread at the moment. So expecting through 
a, a couple of questions or um, some specific examples in the in the chat shortly. You can see that um, that a, a huge chunk of you, 80% plus, are organisational misalignment with agile outside of the teams. Rowan, is that consistent with um, with your experience? Yeah, I think so. Yes, I mean, especially when we have perhaps a bottom up adoption, if you will, or like a one team is uh, actually leading the agile adoption, and then other parts of the organisation that the team depends on, uh, you know, interacts with, are actually not up to the same level of maturity, I guess, with that. So I've just shared the results with you all now. So you can see, um, you can see. There's a fairly even spread in the top three there, but certainly by far um, the organisational misalignment stands out as the biggest challenge challenge faced. Great. So that's one thing we'll be touching on a little here. Actually, <laughs> there's a yeah one of the one of the examples is the contract game. Another is um, water scrum fall that we'll talk about now. I think yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I might just give you a quick introduction to Les though before we go to the water scrum fall topic. Very high level, um, this is based on patterns that have been explored over the last 10, 10 or so years. Uh, it really starts with experiments that um, Baz Voda and Craig Larman uh, were involved in going back even 10 years at the Nokia Siemens networks and, and Valtech and, and really basing the experiments off principles such as Agile and Lean principles. Um, they ended up formulating something like I think uh, 600 experiments into a, a couple of books um, and uh, these books you can see imagine uh, categorizing them I guess as guides they really just give you a whole lot of experiments that have been tried and, and uh, seem to be useful in, in different contexts. However, you know, a lot of this is more easy to understand for fairly advanced practitioners or people who have been into Agile for a while. So um, after quite a lot of experiences in different organisations using these patterns, and I, personally I was involved in some I guess scaled Scrum in the UK that scaled from 80 to 100 to 160 people using a lot of the same sorts of patterns we're talking about here. Uh, back in 2008 that was. Um, but uh, yeah, actually the, the principles themselves on their own are pretty hard to um, apply, a lot of people find. So that's when more recently Craig and Baz decided to formulate it as a framework, a specific set of practices and rules and uh, quite concrete things that you can actually get in and apply. Um, but I guess the key point here is it's based on real world experiments and tried in the field over a period of you know, 10 years really and a lot of, of uh, principles and, and guidance that have been collected up. And uh, if you look at uh, the books, uh, so these are the books that Craig Lam has been involved in, in authoring, 2008 and 2010 are the two books that have a collection of lots and lots of these um, experiments, basically, which uh, have now been formulated into large-scale Scrum, and there's a book on the way specifically about large-scale Scrum. But in the meantime, there's a, a fantastic website that we'll point you to at the end there, less.works. Uh, just one key concept, I guess, in all of this is, what is your product? Well, we're talking a lot about uh, product development and being customer centric. Um, you've often got a business product, I guess, that the business is concerned with, let's say transaction banking as a general product in banking. However, from an IT perspective, you might think of as products as um, things that are more like systems or um, things which we deliver as IT, whether it's a direct entry system, collection system, domestic payment system, etc. So traditionally, I guess we've dealt with these different kind of system um, pieces and developing them or upgrading them, enhancing them as part of a program of work to deliver some sort of business solution or business outcome. However, less takes a bit of a different 
uh, approach to this, instead of a, framing it as a program, it actually frames it as the product, as the business product essentially, and really takes that customer-centric view of what the product is. It's almost like asking your customers, what do you think our products are? And how can we manage to optimize value around that particular product that's really a customer-centric product? So you can sort of see that the, the less product is more aligned to a whole program or a fairly um, customer-centric uh, body of work. Uh, in large-scale Scrum, that's where we have the one product backlog for that customer-centric product and one product owner, actually, um, up to eight teams. And once it goes beyond eight teams, it actually flips into what's called uh, less huge, which is uh, scaling up beyond uh, eight. And yeah, we have one um, product backlog that gets broken out into multiple teams, and those different teams have their own sprint backlogs, perhaps own scrum masters, and initially one scrum master per team until a certain level of maturity when a scrum master might work with two or up to perhaps three teams. But the Scrum Master role in less, of course, is ongoing and, and uh, not temporary. Uh, one sprint, and this is a classic pattern I've seen in scaled up Scrum, is a, the one sprint cadence in which multiple teams operate, all having sprint planning on the same day, all having a combined review of the one product that's being produced across those multiple teams and having retrospectives uh, simultaneously. Less adds the overall retrospective, which looks at systemic um, improvements and challenges, I guess, across the multiple teams in the organization. It also adds a uh, cross-team product backlog refinement, where there's opportunity to understand what other teams may be picking up and the bigger picture on what's coming up in the product. Uh, when we go beyond eight teams, and we're talking about a product owner, remember a single product owner working with up to eight teams, which is one of the really interesting things with less. Uh, we start to flip into less huge, where it is split out into multiple requirement areas. And these are generally split in terms of different uh, coherent groups of features or capabilities in the product, uh, which have a fairly limited dependency between those different areas. And so it's essentially a similar sort of thing, but with area product owners for each area, and an overall product owner for the entire product. Okay, um, I might just flip into some of the challenges now. So water scrum fall is one of the terms that's been uh, coined by Forrester Research actually for something that I think quite a few organizations are finding challenging. We might have a whole lot of teams working in scrum or some sort of iterative agile approach. Um, but often that's not the only thing going on in the bigger picture. There might be upstream activities and downstream activities. They're all part of getting end to end with the overall project or, or product delivery. And just for a quick animation on that, we might have a fairly big batch project scope or product development scope for a quarter or a year. And that's then going into some business analysis activity and perhaps some architecture activity that's fairly all-encompassing for that big batch. And that can take quite a lot of time, I guess, to work through, which could be months. Um, it's then broken down into smaller items, maybe a product backlog that uh, the Agile team is then assembled to do development and testing of. And as we see these small items go, pull, be pulled in by the Agile team and be, um, Developed, there's a small uh, small increments of the product being produced quite quickly. So each two, two weeks, if you're doing a two week sprint, we're building up this product incrementally. However, um, this product is just sitting there, I guess, internally being staged up, but not being deployed because it's dependent on other groups in the organisation to do further activities to actually deploy it. So that comes out as a fairly large batch. Uh, product that's been iteratively developed in these small batches um, going into system testing, UAT, perhaps deployment, and finally coming out to, uh, to end users many months later. And that's when we might finally find out whether or not it puts a, 
uh, a smile or a frown on the, the faces of those users and uh, see whether we're starting to get the, the results we're after. Now, what, what changes with good Scrum and with large-scale Scrum is really that we're trying to, to get that value stream, uh, all those people involved working much more closely as a very cross-functional uh, group and a feature team. And this means that they can actually get these small batches delivered right out to end users in, as we go fairly incrementally. And even if we find that what we produce early on isn't quite right, the game changer here is the feedback we get early and often from those users. And we can get feedback on both product and process quality that can help us to very quickly adjust and turn the frown upside down, I guess, as you might say, to uh, give uh, those users what they really need and realize the, the benefits that we, we're really after. So yeah, that means having uh, the skills to be able to do that. Um, just something I do on Scrum courses, this is very fresh from yesterday, is a, a, a lean simulation that really shows the big difference between working in big batches, a la waterfall, or a la doing sort of three months of uh, planning and, and just trying to execute on that, um, versus the small batch, which is uh, what you see on the right hand side. It's, I guess, seconds when we do a simulation like this, but you might think of this as days for a real project. So 146 days to produce the same scope of work that down the bottom there is produced in 46 days with small batches. And of course, you can start to get something for your money, I guess, within the 10, 10 seconds or 10 <laughs> days, it might be even, um, in that bottom scenario versus 144 days where it all comes in one big bang batch at the end. All right, so that was the water scrum fall in a nutshell. There's probably a lot of other phrases for that out there too. Um, fragile and uh, wagile and a few others. <laughs> uh, dependency hell, okay. Just very quickly, we often have component teams in organizations where we've got perhaps different systems. We might have a content management system, a, a search component, um, mobile, uh, front ends and things like this and often teams have been structured to be specialized in one component and um, what that means for delivering chunks of value is that those features might cut across multiple components you might need to update the front end you might need to update the cms you might need to update the search component all to deliver a chunk of value and that puts a lot of the dependency management load into planning time so we need to figure out which component teams do we need to um, carve off this work to to actually produce something of value. And of course, to produce the feature, we need multiple teams to all do their pieces and, and figure this out and pull it together. And we start to get things like this where you um, may have quite intricate dependencies between pieces of work that all need to come together to produce a feature. So the yellow boxes are perhaps these different pieces of work and the blue are the actual features that are evaluating features that we might be able to actually show people and deploy. The idea with moving from component teams to feature teams is a real game changer in terms of dealing with dependencies. Um, instead of uh, having to rely on multiple component teams to do different bits and pieces to produce a feature, the idea is that a feature team can actually do whatever work is needed across multiple components to actually produce that value adding feature. And it's a real structural thing to look at in the organization to see how can we uh, get our, our teams more able to do features end to end and not have to be dependent on multiple other teams to do that. I've certainly seen that this issue um, you know, recently with uh, mobile teams trying to do something which is highly dependent on a content management system. And um, you know, the content management system had the people doing that development had their own queues and own priorities and took a long time to respond to the requests of the mobile teams who just needed a small change to an interface to actually get the right content to do their, their mobile app. Um, instead of that, if the feature team could just directly go and make that small change to the, to the interface to get content directly, it would have sped it up uh, enormously and, and had far less coordination overheads to, to do that. Um, so what we're looking at with moving to feature teams is the, the dependencies are pushed from planning time to integration time. And this is where we can leverage uh, c continuous integration to very quickly identify if two different teams have 
clashed in terms of their changes to their component and uh, trigger cross-team communication on that basis rather than having to preemptively figure out well, which teams we need to cut this off to and wait till those teams to finish their pieces of work. Yeah, so coordination in shared code, and this is really using some of the uh, the tools and techniques we've had around for some years now in agile development with uh, continuous integration, etc. Yeah, so feature teams are customer centric, just to summarize, uh, stable, long lived, and it's a case of, of skilling up to be able to, to work with different components to produce the features as needed. So there is a a learning curve to, to doing this or to, even to pulling in the right um, people to, to get the skills in feature teams, but it's a, a problem that's very um, worthwhile solving, I believe. And certainly helps with agility. Uh, release rigidity. So just in a nutshell, if you are planning um, fairly big batches, I guess, of sort of three months worth of work and just releasing once, uh, for that, that release plan that you do infrequently. Uh, we might be looking at something like four releases a year, I guess, quarterly releases. However, yeah, if we can have a potentially shippable product increment every sprint, we're now talking about more like 25 potential releases a year. And just imagine if you are doing four releases a year and your competitor is doing 25 releases a year, um, just how much more learning and how much more um, early value realization you can get with those different strategies. And of course, good Scrum is all based around this idea of potentially shippable product increment being what we're striving to achieve, which puts the organization in, in uh, gives you the opportunity for business agility really to release early and often. And it's really, it's a big difference in terms of um, benefits realization too. If you don't put out a release for six months or perhaps three months, you're kind of leaving money on the table in terms of not getting any of that that value you could have perhaps got um, for some of those earlier uh, releases. Um, and yeah, it gives a whole lot of um, benefits in terms of the feedback loop being tighter, um, yeah, having uh, improved visibility and something meaningful, earlier learning, all these sorts of things. And of course, this is really going straight back to the Agile Manifesto, right, when it talked about delivering working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference from the shorter time scale. So we're trying to get away from only being able to release once a quarter or um, you know, once a year or something. Contract game. Um, and this is, I think, a fairly big picture thing that a lot of organizations have, have uh, <laughs> found a challenge. Um, often we've got external demand or external contracts even that we're doing with the marketplace or with partners or you know big business opportunities we're trying to service. And the business in trying to help get IT to help with realizing this, those needs will tend to try to get IT to agree to an internal contract of a certain scope perhaps by a certain certain date. So it's a sort of game where there's some sort of milestone point which can be quite arbitrary in terms of when it's decided what is going to be in the scope and perhaps what the timeline is for the for release of that agreed scope. Um, hopefully it's nothing like some of the things I've had <laughs> friends um, involved with, which perhaps was an 18-month um, overall project and they spent 15 months just figuring out the, uh, the scope and the, the requirements and then handed it to development with three months to go. So um, hopefully it's not as extreme as that, but uh, sometimes it is a little bit uh, tricky. So what's going on there is often the, the business is playing this game where we're, we're trying to agree something and hand it off to development. Okay, And it means that the responsibility is shifting from the business over to the development or IT organization to fulfill that internal contract. And in doing so, the basically the business is actually losing control quite often. IT is now taking over control of how to go about delivering it and traditionally we've often done that by breaking things down into activities and quite technical tasks and things and it's not very clear you know, how you, that maps back to some of the business um, value. And yeah, it's um, often this 
situation where uh, the visibility and true status of progress is lost. And, and certainly the big thing that's lost here is that the business loses the opportunity to make um, well-informed trade-off decisions to maximise its value for money. Um, it's all just gone into this um, IT organisation and uh, the business is just getting perhaps status reports that sort of say it's still on track, it's still on track or, or, or not so. So um, this can be problematic when you try to be more agile. I guess um, what sometimes happens too is, is it's a bit of a uh, interesting communication pattern where within IT and perhaps within a development team, people might say this is not going so well, it's a bit of a mess, no idea how this is, we're going to get this all done. Um, just talking to, to a first level manager or someone, a team lead or something like that, um, they might say to their manager, it's kind of rough when we're managing the problem. <laughs> and uh, they might say to the, their boss, uh, I think we're basically on track, we're doing some minor risk management to head off issues arising. So basically, we're losing something in the communication and back up to perhaps business stakeholders to whom it might sound like everything's going fine. We've got some risks, but they're all being <laughs> managed. So uh, the point of this, is, and I guess there's a deal bit that summarizes pretty well, is that uh, there's opacity in the system, that what's really going on you know, is quite disconnected with what people outside are, are kind of understanding and, and hearing and knowing about. And of course, yeah, Scrum works best when there's, there's transparency, right? And um, it's important that it's not um, that people are hiding things because they want to make it look like we're, we're on track or to some sort of predictive plan, but we're actually being clear about the reality of the situation so that we can actually respond to change and make good decisions along the way. And of course, this is responding to change over following a plan. Uh, a lot of what's yeah often going on is over a long period of time too, there's this pressure for more scope to be added. The business might be saying more, 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 and the development group might be saying, geez, we're already in a bit of uh, time pressure, less, less, less. And both parties are kind of you know pushing at each other. It's a fairly sort of adversarial game to business wants more, development wants less, and all of this is you know, kind of in a, an environment where we can't perfectly predict uh, everything because it's in a complex uh, product development space and there's unknown unknowns as well as known unknowns. So I guess what we're getting at is if, if there's a surprise, if we find out, oh gee, we can't deliver everything that we um, were perhaps somewhat pressured to agree to early on as the IT organization, um, you know, the business might come back with, but you committed, but you promised. Um, this is what you agreed to at the start. And again, we're, we're getting into a bit of a blame game potentially there. Uh, business thinks it's your fault for the IT group saying, you know, you committed to this stuff, but you're not delivering it. And IT says, no, it was business is your fault. You pushed us into the, to actually committing to something that we couldn't really be that confident that was, was going to work out exactly that way. So, uh, yeah, what development often pulls out to try to deliver things on, on time at least is uh, what we might call a secret toolbox of no longer putting as much effort into getting good design in there internally, um, not doing as much testing, not um, perhaps fixing all the defects. And, yeah, over time this erodes the, erodes the quality of the product internally and its maintainability. This is often what we call technical debt. And um, yeah, this is a real problem when we're under time pressure and things like that. I won't go through all of this right here, but just to be aware, there's some really nice ways to uh, illustrate the organizational dynamics going on quite often. And uh, this is a tool from systems thinking called um, uh, causal loop diagrams or cause and effect diagrams. And it's the sort of thing you can do interactively to try to get a shared understanding of what are the organizational dynamics that perhaps lead to some of these sorts of issues. And yeah, I guess a lot of these things, yeah, lead to a bit of environment of distrust. We've got this kind of two-party competitive game going on where the business is pushing in one direction and IT is pushing in another direction and business is not really seeing the, the trade-offs that could be made to bring about a, 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 a um, successful outcome. 
and um, you know, IT is quite quite frustrated that we have to compromise and include so much technical debt, I guess, along the way to just deliver uh, something by a fairly arbitrary point. So yeah, this is the opposite of what we're looking for in Agile. Actually, the the competitive game you know, is a, a win lose type of game. Um, versus cooperative game, which is what we're looking for, a win-win game. How can both parties win and both parties um, really be more in a partnership type um, relationship than a competitive relationship? And this is exactly what the Agile Manifesto was talking about with customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And we're not talking here just about commercial contracts with external parties, we're talking about the internal contract between perhaps business and, and development and saying actually business, let's collaborate, let's have you involved in making well-informed trade-off decisions along the way to bring about the best possible outcome rather than being locked in uh, to a contract that we realise we can't fulfil. So the idea with Scrum and with large-scale Scrum, really less uh, articulates this very nicely I think is that uh, it's actually the business to get engaged with development in the form of a product donor to make well-informed trade-off decisions as we go and to try to avoid the contract gain in doing so and to say let's actually play it a different way. And it might be a case of um, moving from a model where it's intermediated by um, program management or some sort of contract in between and more facilitating a direct interaction between the business and development. Uh, business represented by the product owner who has the authority to make the trade-off decisions necessary to maximise value and bring about a good outcome. Rowan, um, ECM, is that Scrum Master? Scrum Master, yes. Yeah. Yeah. A PO product owner there, yeah. Cool. Uh, and I think this just relates back to some of the principles we have right at the top of our Agile Manifesto principles. So. Highest priority is, is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Um, just might do a quick touch on one or two more. <laughs> okay, the skills bottleneck thing, because a lot of, I guess, concerns about moving to feature teams and, and working some of the ways we're suggesting uh, come from, well, not for a particular feature, certain teams can't actually do the work because they don't have the specialised skills necessary. So let's just think about an example for a second. On the product backlog, imagine you have a backlog item that's got requirement for skills A, B, C, and you have a team perhaps over to the right which has skills A, B, C. It would make a lot of sense for that team to select that backlog item because it's a good fit to their skills mix. Um, for those other two teams, um, neither of them have an exact fit to that backlog item with skill needs of D, E, F. However, they've got a considerable amount of skill with E and F or with um, D and E so there might be an opportunity for one of them to, to choose that backlog item and then to learn about the, the one thing that they aren't as skilled in as part of um, taking on that backlog item. So that team will slow down as they learn a bit about D let's say in this example here. However the principles if you look at them um, at the bottom there um, we're saying that whenever we can use specialisation to maximum advantage we use it but when specialisation becomes a constraint or really is holding the flow of value up then we want to break that constraint and perhaps that means um, doing a high value thing slower rather than doing a low value thing as fast as, as possible. Uh, like across team learning, the patterns in, in less include things like uh, big room backlog refinement, so instead of big room planning, actually getting multiple teams together in a large space to actually understand the domain better and what's coming up. Also, uh, a nice format called the science fair or trade show type sprint review, and a cl client of mine in, in Sydney has been using this for a while to have people go and have informal conversations around multiple different demonstrations in the sprint review and have a lot of those um, informal chats and then bring that together and uh, just talk about how's the, the product shaping up and it's a really good way to, to get a lot of rich dialogue going about the products in your sprint reviews with a large group of people. Um, it's also joint retrospectives as I mentioned before. 
So there's lots of opportunities to do cross-functional learning and, and do things across teams. Uh, in, in less, even though we're not all on the same team, we can uh, have people talk across teams. And that includes some of the um, design and architecture. So um, I won't go through this one in detail, just to say that what we're, what we're moving away from is those component teams into to feature teams with sort of model. And with those feature teams having cross-team design workshops, cross-team backlog refinement workshops we mentioned, and actually cross-team uh, collaborative documentation of what the current architecture and design is, perhaps on whiteboards and things like this. So it's about socialising understanding of things across teams uh, rather than needing everyone on the same team to understand things. Great. Cool. So that's basically the, the core topics I wanted to cover today. Um, I just do have one slide on things that uh, less is not, which is uh, basically sort of showing the intent of it being different from perhaps other other ways of working, including other scaling approaches. So we talked about the contract game, trying to get away from that, um, getting away from heavy dependency load, especially at planning time, through the use of feature teams. Um, it's less is not a heavy methodology to be tailored down. It's actually quite a, a lightweight framework, a bit like Scrum. In fact, it's really Scrum at scale. It really is Scrum, and it's not being Scrum. Uh, it's not being contained within something else that's perhaps bigger batch and less adaptable. And it's uh, yeah, prioritization by the business directly um, without intermediation by intermediary roles and rich communication between business and development. Well, Robert, that was, um, that was a full presentation. I really appreciate the, the effort you put into that. Um, we, are, we do have a couple of minutes left for a few questions. Um, as, we, as we work through the, the, last of, um, the last of those questions, what I'd just like to um, let you know about is our next free uh, webinar here at Equinox IT will be on why business rules are a must for business analysts. So pre presenters for that will be Ron Ross and Gladys Lamb, who are Equinox IT uh, partners. They're they're out from the US, out this way, um, late late um, late in July and early August. So we'd love to have you join us on that webinar on the sixth of August. Ron will be back with us here in um, New Zealand during September. And you could learn more about um, Scrum, specifically the Certified Scrum Product Owner and Scrum Master courses that Rowan will be delivering in Wellington and Auckland when he's next with us. So um, just a few minutes now for questions and answers. I do have a question from Nilish Rowan. How does it align when we need to put commercial contracts in place with vendors? Yeah, so good question. Um, Basically, the person who has that commercial contract fulfillment responsibility from the business um, may be the person that takes the steering wheel in the form of the product owner. Um, if not that person, then someone close to that concern of fulfilling the external contract to actually work on prioritizing um, what it is we need fulfilled to, to realize that, that external contract. Hmm. Nilish, um, let me know if that, that answers your question. A second question now from Bernard. How do you deal with a project or program that's not, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to product development, such as an organisation-wide integration as the result of an acquisition? So you can, yeah, think about how the, the concept of a product, whilst it might be called product, can translate to a, a a business outcome, um, and it might not be a single deliverable. It might be uh, a series of, of things that all go into producing that that business outcome. But fundamentally, what we're talking about is is making good trade offs across the investments to produce that business outcome. And I think a lot of these patterns can apply even if you don't think of it as a single single product. Thanks. So um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Rowan, thanks again for your insightful presentation. Uh, if you do, guys out there, if you do have questions as a result of this presentation, feel free to get in touch with us. You'll have our contact details 
as you exit the webinar today, uh, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation form that, that helps us um, helps us continuously improve the education program that we make available to you. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for coming and we look forward to having you online with us uh, next time round. Have a good afternoon.